Wyoming, Oakland, and beyond. Hope y'all are doing well on this beautiful Monday night in Oakland, East Bay, and beyond. It is Monday night, which means, of course, it is time once again for some Monday night AFR. Ra is Oakland. Welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen. It is show number 278 as the playoff editions continue to roll on here on your number one source for everything and anything on your Oakland Athletics. Let's go ahead and get this edition of A's Fan Radio underway. What's going on, everybody? It is the Legally 5150 Corporal Wrightfield Asshole checking in, of course, from the new Dub 6 Studios located up in the Eastmont Hills, overlooking the Deep East, the Oakland Coliseum, the Bay Area, and beyond. Hope everybody is doing good out there. Uh, I'm currently uh, recovering still at the moment from uh, having my flu shot a couple days ago. So, yeah, Corporal uh, obviously went and got done what he had to do to make sure he doesn't catch no disgusting, nasty, germy viruses and whatnot during the uh, the winter months and obviously still masking up and doing what I uh, need to do in regards to making sure I don't catch COVID. So if I kind of sound a little stuffed up or sound like I'm sick, don't worry, I'm not sick. I just went and had my uh, my shot or my flu shot taken care of, got the flu injected into me. And well, you, you all know how it works. You, all of you out there, I'm pretty sure at some point or another have had a flu shot or whatnot. And if you haven't, then, you know, I don't know what's up with you in regards to that. Um, Hoping to be joined by the main man, the boss man, later on at some point during this broadcast. It ultimately uh, will hinge on what boss has going on on his end. So you may get the dynamic duel tonight. You might just get stuck with my legally 5150 ass. We will uh, see as this edition of the show rolls on. And obviously, yes, even though our beloved green and gold um, did not... uh, advance far enough into the postseason as many of us had hoped that they would do we're still rolling on here with ace talk from the pants point of view even though ace talk up until we get to the off season is going to be kind of probably a little bit limited at this point unless anything major uh breaks between now and before the um last two shows we got on tap before we take our off season break and of course for those of you that may not have been paying attention and are wondering why we're still doing shows even though the a's aren't in the playoffs anymore it's because we made the decision that obviously with dates that uh we had to cancel with the season's start being postponed because of COVID-19 that we would go ahead and regardless uh how far the A's advanced in this year's postseason that we would go ahead and do shows through the end of the World Series so after tonight we got two more regular season shows on tap for y'all it will of course uh, be the final uh, playoff edition of AFR next Thursday night as we finally uh, return back to some normalcy I guess you can say and go back to our regularly uh, Thursday uh, broadcasting time frame after doing a couple Monday night editions of the show um, the last couple of weeks and whatnot and then of course we'll be uh, we'll have our season review show on November the 5th before we go and take a two three week break and get ready to uh, do things with the off season I'm still uh, in the process right now of waiting to hear back from the uh Oakland Athletics, by the way, if we will have Dave Cobble on that uh, November the 5th show for uh, the next uh, episode of the Kicking It with Cobble segment. So stay tuned for that. We'll keep you posted on that and let you know about anything else that goes down there. And, of course, that also means that uh, there's only two more shows left of yours truly calling himself Corporal Rightfield Asshole before he officially rebrands himself as Corporal Oaktown during the off season. Uh, again, if you all missed that, uh, Professional move on my choice, obviously, as much as I have appreciated and loved that that nickname reflects who I am, not going to be a professional nickname to carry on over as far as what I want to do uh, furthering my broadcasting career and whatnot. So, yep, two more shows of the old Corporal RFA nickname going down before Corporal Rightfield Asshole is hung up from a telephone wire and becomes uh, Corporal Oaktown. Those, of course, of you that don't remember, Corporal Oaktown was my... uh, Super fan name for a certain team that abandoned this region, uh, this region for a second time. So kind of put that in a hiatus, and now obviously planning on uh, bringing that out of hiatus when we get into the off season. So, yep, that's what we got to look forward to. And yeah, and like I said, waiting to see if Boss will be joining me or not. Uh, while we await to see if the other half of Internet Radio's uh, dynamic duel will be joining my legally 150 150 ass or not, we will go ahead and continue on here and let's go ahead and uh, get things started here on this first segment of tonight's broadcast. As of course, we are continuing to recap the uh, latest action going on in the 2020 postseason. And uh, we will go ahead and kick things off, of course, first with what went down in the American League Championship Series, which, of course, featured a matchup of a 
sub-500 team that everyone has been hating on ever since revelations of cheating uh, came to light uh, during their uh, 2017 World Series run. I'm, of course, talking about the Houston Astros, a.k.a. the Houston Asterix, or whatever the bloody hell you um, folks out there want to choose to call them uh, at this point in time. The uh, wild card, uh, one of the two wild card teams, and, of course, the team that uh, unfortunately knocked our asses off in the ALDS three games to one, taking on the top seeded team in the American League, which of course went the full seven or the full five games, excuse me, in their divisional series matchup with the Yankees and outlasted the Bronx Bombers. That number one seeded team, of course, being the Tampa Bay Rays. And we're going to go ahead now and take a look back at um, how things played out over the course of this ALCS and. Uh, very interesting ALCS, I will say for that, given the fact that uh, initially it kind of looked like things were going to get wrapped up with this relatively quickly, and then it got flipped on its head. And, of course, if you somehow missed out on that action, if you're one of those you who's that uh, doesn't pay attention once the A's get knocked out or you loosely pay attention to what's going on and are kind of, you know, maybe wondering what happened if you missed what went down, well... Here's what went down in that ALCS between the Tampa Bay Rays and the Houston Astros. And we'll go ahead and kick things off with what went down in Game 1 of that ALCS. Game 1, of course, went down on Sunday, October the 11th. The Astros would draw first blood in that Game 1 matchup when they would score the first run of the game in the top of the first inning. About three and a half innings later, in the bottom of the fourth inning, the Tampa Bay Rays would tie the game up with a single run of their own. They then would also go on to add on what would be their final run of the game in the top of the fifth inning and really wouldn't need to do much the rest of the way out is because after the Astros scored that run in the first inning, they were held to eight consecutive goose eggs the rest of the way out in this one as the Tampa Bay Rays took game one of the 2020 ALCS, defeating the Astros by the final of two to one. Tampa Bay, two runs, six hits, no errors. Houston, one run, nine hits, and one error in this contest. Blake Snell picking up the win for Tampa Bay. Valdez taking the loss for the Astros. And Castillo getting the save for Tampa Bay in that game one matchup. Home runs first over on the asterisk side. The little short bastard Oompa Loompa known as Jose Altuve, who um, kind of went on a tear all of a sudden after basically not being anywhere to be seen in the play in the regular season and even kind of to some extent in their matchup with the twins Altuve uh, getting a homer in this one and also only one home run being hit on the other side of things by the Rays in this one and that coming off the bat of Orzarina I believe is how he pronounces his name the big rookie down there with the uh, Tampa Bay Rays him hitting a ding-dong doodle for Tampa in this one as mentioned Snell got the win for the Rays in this one five innings pitch six hits given up one run that one run being uh, earned Two walks, two strikeouts, and, of course, the lone long ball that he surrendered to uh, Oompa Loompa Altuve. So Tampa Bay jumping out to an early lead to kick things off in this American League Championship Series of 2020. And pretty sure, obviously, that everybody out there that is not a Houston Astros fan definitely was liking the uh, the, t the tone that was set off here. Obviously, it wasn't a, you know, blowout, you know, back-and-forth slugfest. It was more of, you know, traditional low scoring game you had a couple you know one team each hitting the home run and then obviously the Rays playing a little bit more traditional ball to uh, get that second run in and then rely on their pitching to shut down Houston's offense for the rest of the way out let's go ahead now and take a look and see if that would carry over and set things up for the Rays to go up 2-0 in game two which of course went down on October the 12th or if the Asterix would somehow some way figure out a way to knock this series up at one game apiece Tampa would score first in this Monday, October the 12th contest that was Game 2 when they would drop a three-run spot on the Houston Astros in the bottom of the first inning. No scoring would be done after that until the top of the sixth when the Astros would finally get their first run of the game across. And then about an inning later or half inning, inning and a half later, you could say, bottom of the seventh inning, Tampa would score what would be their final run of the contest in the bottom of the seventh. Houston would score a single run in the top of the ninth, but that would be all for naught as Tampa Bay would jump out to an early 2-0 series lead as they win game two over the Astros by the final of 
to two. Tampa Bay, four runs, four hits, no errors. Houston, two runs, 10 hits, and two errors in this game two contest. Morton picking up the win for Tampa Bay. McCullers taking the L for the Asterix, and Anderson picking up the save for the Rays in this one. Home runs in this one, another uh, individual from the Astros that's been kind of looked at as a jackass outside of Houston because of his uh, consistent running of his mouth. I'm talking about uh, none other than Alex Correa, who, um, going to be honest, tries to seem like he's a wannabe A-Rod at some extent. And, uh, yeah, buddy, you may you may want to knock that off before you start turning off a lot of fans to, uh, to you outside of Houston, though. Many of them probably have turned off to you already anyway because of your comments and the cheating and all that. Uh, Correa being the lone homer for the Astros in this contest. Um, you had a couple home runs for the uh, Rays in this one as Margot hit his uh, first home run, I uh, believe, of the postseason in this one. And Zanino also went yard for the Rays in this contest as well. Morton, as mentioned, got the win for the Rays. Went five innings, five hits given up, uh, no runs given up, one walk, and five punch outs over his five frames. So, yep. Looking pretty good there if you're a Tampa Bay Rays fan. Looking pretty good, obviously, if you're not a Houston Astros fan because you're sitting there watching, you know, basically the Tampa Bay Rays doing what the Oakland Athletics should have done in the ALDS, you know. And we, we, we've touched bases already before on issues on why the A's continue to struggle with getting to the next level, so there's no reason to reiterate and get on top of that stuff. You know the drill. You all have heard it from us multiple times over the years. You'll probably end up hearing it from us again at some point in the off season about that. But, you know, I just, you know, enjoyed, you know, in these two games watching Tampa doing the little things they need to do in order to do this and obviously being able to score runs on more than, you know, just a long ball. You know, yeah, they had two home runs in this game too, but, you know, they only had the one in the first game and were able to get the, another run without a home run, which is a big thing that myself, boss man, and many of you all out there were extremely getting pissed off about in regards to the A's, not just during the postseason, but during the regular season and the last couple of seasons as well. So Tampa Bay showing what the uh, the Oakland Athletics uh, should have been done, or been doing, I should say, and uh, that would pretty much continue to be the case and carry over into the third game of this best-of-seven ALCS matchup. Let's go ahead now and take a look at what went down in Game 3 action between the Rays and the Astros. Game 3, of course, going down back on Tuesday, October the 13th. Oh, and by the way, before I forget to mention, of course, Tampa Bay was the home team for the first two games. These next three games, of course, would see the Astros as the home team. Houston would score first in this contest when they would score the first run of the game in the bottom of the first inning. They would hold that one nothing lead until the top of the six when the Tampa Bay Rays decided to explode for a five-run spot on them in the top half of that frame. The Astros would uh, score what would be the final run for them in this contest in the bottom of the sixth inning as both teams would hold each other to goose eggs for the final third of the game. That would be good for Tampa, not so good for Houston, as Tampa wins the third game of the ALCS and jumps out to an early 3-0 lead on the Astros. They take this game by the final of 5-2. to two. Tampa Bay, five runs, eight hits, no errors. Houston, two runs, seven hits, and one error in this contest. Yarborough picking up the win for Tampa Bay. Eureka, uh, uh, God, I'm sure, i got to get better pronounced on some of these names out there. Your Quide, I believe it is, taking the loss for the, uh, for the Astros in this one. And Castillo picking up uh, another save in this ALCS for the Rays in this one. Home runs in this contest, nobody going deep on the Tampa side. Over on the Astros side, Jose Altuve somehow yet again, after not doing Jack Diddley squat during the regular season, not doing Jack Diddley squat really against the Twins, and then somehow all of a sudden catching fire like a buzzsaw against Oakland, um, going deep again back, uh, in this one. And then you also had Michael Brantley, who's been another, you know, one of the hot sticks that's been swinging out of his shoes, basically, <laughs> for the Astros in this postseason. Brantley going deep as well in this one. As mentioned, Yarborough getting the win for the Rays. Five innings pitch, three hits given up, two runs um, surrendered. Those two runs both being earned. Two walks, five punch outs, and then, of course, the two uh, long balls given up in this one. So, pff, man. Man, oh man, obviously a lot of us out there hoping that Tampa Bay would be able to, you know, basically would seal the deal in this somehow, some way, knock the Astros out, you know, do the baseball world a solid and move these guys out. And, you know, probably weren't expecting these guys, you know, even yes, they are the number one ranked team in the AL, the top seeded team in the AL. 
pretty sure that none of us out there, except maybe a few Rays fans out there, and maybe a few onesie twosies spread across all the various <laughs> fan bases in baseball, could have said that they saw you know the Rays jumping out to a three zero lead, and it just it, you know clearly would have been great, obviously. And, you know, maybe not so great looking at us, but I wouldn't have given a crap. It ultimately would have been extremely great and freaking hilarious <laughs> if Tampa took down the Astros in four straight games. Would that be the case, however? Let's go ahead and find out right now, right here, right now, if, like I said, for those of you that weren't paying attention to what went down in this ALCS, let's find out right here, right now, if the Tampa Bay Rays were able to pull off and, well, I forgot that I don't got the, uh, the logo switched around on there. So you're stuck you looking at that, those logos the way they are. I forgot that to download the ones for Houston being the home team. And yeah, whatever. Anyway, let's go and take a look right here right now on if the Tampa Bay Rays were able to secure a four-game sweep of the Houston Astros or if Tampa Bay, or excuse me, or if Houston somehow, some way would be able to live the fight another day. Here's what went down in game four of the ALDS back on Wednesday, October the 14th. For the second game in a row, Houston would score first as they would plant the first run of the game in the bottom of the first inning. They would also score a single run in the bottom of the third inning before the Tampa Bay Rays would knock the game up at two with a two-run spot in the top of the fourth. The Astros would jump back out to a two-run lead, however, when they would score two runs in the bottom of the fifth inning. The Astros wouldn't score at all the rest of the way out, but unfortunately the Tampa Bay Rays were only able to squeeze across one run after that two-run spot in the fourth, that final run of the game for the Rays coming in the top of the ninth as the Astros find a way to, out, to live on to fight yet another day as they take game four and hand the Rays their first loss in this ALCS matchup. Sorry, getting all tongue-twisted there. As they beat the Rays in game four by the final of four to three. Houston four runs, nine hits, no errors. Tampa Bay three runs, seven hits, and no errors in this contest. Granke picking up the win for the Astros. Glasnow hit, uh, Glasnow, uh, Glasnow, uh, Glasnow taking the loss for the Rays and Presley picking up the save for the Astros in this one. Home runs in this contest over on the Rays side. The lone home run coming off the bat of uh, Ozarina, or Ozarini. Again, I'll get used to pronouncing these names at some point, at some point, uh, somehow. <laughs> and then over on the Astro side, yet again, Jose Altuve going deep and Springer going deep as well for Houston in this contest. Uh, mentioned uh, Grinke getting the win, six runs, five hits, two runs given up, both those runs being earned, one walk, seven punch outs, and a home run surrendered in this contest. So, eh, it is what it is. You kind of figured and suspected that Tampa Bay would be able to do something. And, oh, hold on one quick second, ladies and gentlemen. Boss, hold on. Let me get you uh, plugged in here real quick before I get things started up here. Um, great, great radio here. I lo always love it how my main man calls in right when I'm in the middle of doing something. Uh, let's go ahead and pause real quickly from uh, – game or ALCS uh, recap action as we go ahead now and welcome the other half of internet radio's most dynamic duel to the studio. Boss man, what's up? Uh, before you checked in, we had already gone through uh, recapping the first four games of the ALCS. So before we uh, get on into recapping Game 5, why don't you real quickly share your thoughts on the first uh, four games between the Astros and the Rays? Well, it was um, domination. Obviously, uh, two Rays' mistakes were highlighted. I mean, people start 
going to Chuck Knobloch and um, what's the other guy, man? The, the Red Sox guy. You know, the guy that, that messed up in game six. The people, whenever you mess up like that in the postseason, the guy is escaping my name right now. Although, I'm a little drunk right now. But, <laughs> you know what? <laughs> but, you know, um, in, in baseball in the postseason, man, gloves and you not making a mistake in the field, uh, it, it's the difference between winning and losing. I mean, you look at the A's in the last series. I mean, I love the mindset that the A's, well, at least Marcus Simeon for that matter, had he been able to make that play on Josh Redden and get out of that inning, A's going uh, to the bottom of the six or five or three with a chance to extend the lead, but that will save me going into the seventh with a pretty good bullpen up. Uh, five to three with nine outs to go. I mean, stuff like that happens. But you know, you gotta give it to the Devil Rays. Devil Rays are three games. One, I'm calling Devil Rays. The Rays, excuse me, I'm still old school. But the Rays are three games to one. And, you know, you just used to play for their life, but it looks like by and far that the uh, Rays are clearly the better team. I mean, they've uh, expounded on what they had last year. Uh, they lost in five games. To the Astros and the ALDS after beating the A's in a wild card game in Oakland. So, you know, this team, they know they have a window. They're shockingly very, very elite. And I, I'm not surprised. Uh, you know, all of America is rooting for the damn Rays. You know, you have three games to one. You should have called this out in game five. But, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda is the name of the game in life, you know. Here is, by the way, what went down in that Game 5 matchup, which we were getting into recapping before the main man, of course, joined me here on the show. Tampa, or excuse me, Houston would score first in this Game 5 contest. It, of course, went back uh, went down on Thursday, October the 15th. They would score a single run. They would score a single run in the bottom of the, of the first inning. And um, also, which um, blah, I'm getting tongue twisted here. Sorry, Houston would score their first run in the bottom of the first inning. Tampa Bay would tie the game up with a single run in the top of the third before Houston would retake the lead with a two-run spot in the bottom of that third inning. Um, I think Boss might have just inadvertently uh, hung up on me right there. Uh, we'll wait to see if he uh, comes back and checks in here in a bit Houston um, where did I leave off okay so Houston tied up the game with a single run in the third inning before uh, the Astros retook the lead with a two-run spot um, in the top of the uh, <clears throat> excuse me with the bottom of the third inning uh, boss hold on I'm plugging you back in because I saw that you uh, somehow disconnected so hold on one quick second as I get you plugged back in over there all righty, now that we got you back in, where did we uh, leave off on here? Okay, so Houston up 3-2 um, after the third inning. Tampa Bay would tie the game up with a single run in the top of the fifth, and then, uh, or excuse me, would score a single run in the fifth, single run in the eighth, and then the Astros, of course, would walk up off with a single run in the bottom of the fourth, uh, the bottom of the ninth, as they take... Um, where the hell, what the hell are we? Game five here. They would take game five by the final of four to three. Houston, four runs, six hits, no errors. Tampa Bay, three runs, seven hits, and one error. Presley picking up the win for Houston. Anderson taking the loss for Tampa Bay. Boss, your thoughts on game five? What a great game. Uh, you know, even though we hate the Astros, baseball, you know, close games like this, and, uh, you know, a lot of defense, a lot of clutch pitching is, is the name of the game. That is what signifies... October baseball, and I don't think there's anything short of that uh, in this game. You know, credit to the Astros, obviously they've been known as Peters or what have you, but for them to uh, dig deep in this manner, when it looks like, well, hell, let's just be honest, it looked all bad for them after being uh, down three games to two. I mean, this is three games to nothing, now it's three games to two. you made a series of this, and the point is all on the Tampa Bay Rays now. You know, you after winning three in a row, you've dropped back-to-back games. And there was situations where they could have gotten more than one run in the innings that they did score, and they weren't, they weren't able to do it. You know, you have to take advantage in, um, in baseball, man. You just really got to take advantage when you have opportunities with men on base, uh, you really have to make things happen. I mean, they were 0 for 6 on runners in scoring position. When that happens, 
Bucks, man, you're not going to win. I mean, you're leaving, you know, I believe it was 10 men on base, still something like that. I couldn't remember what the post game show when Pedro and Jimmy Robinson were talking. But when you do those things, you seem like the Astros, they're going to make you pay. And Carlos Correa called his shot, and when you call your shot and you tell your manager, I'm walking off, the big time, the, being a big time player, he's been big time all of October. This guy was a number one draft pick for a reason. He has the Asterisk World title. They obviously have been a pretty good team, uh, albeit having the trash can. But this guy was drafted number one for a reason, and he came through when he needed it most. Still sucks, though. And also as a result of that, that momentum might have carried over into the sixth game of this ALCS, as, of course, things would revert back to Tampa Bay being the whole home team. But, of course, as we all know, with this damn bubble going on, neutral site, and if you all forgot, these games, of course, were going on at Petco Park. Anyway, here's what went down in Game 6 of the 2020 ALCS. Game 6 happening, of course, a little over two or three days ago, back on Friday, October the 16th. Tampa would score first in this contest when he would score the first run of the game in the bottom of the second inning. That lead would last until the top of the fifth when the Houston Astros would drop a four-run spot on them in the top half of that frame. The Astros would then also score um, one run in the top of the sixth and two runs in the top of the seventh. Tampa then would score one run in the bottom of the seventh and what would be their final two runs of the game in the bottom of the eighth as the Astros come back to tie up the ALCS at three games apiece taking game seven, or excuse me, taking game six by the final of seven to four. Houston, seven runs, 11 hits, no errors. Tampa Bay, four runs, six hits, no errors in this contest. Valdez picking up the win for Houston. Snell taking the loss for the uh, for the Rays. And Presley picking up the save for Houston in this one. And man, boss, and I told this to you that night, or I believe it was the next day. You know, you went up 3-0. You allow these guys to come back in. You know, and I obviously didn't want to see it happen, but the mindset I had is, you know, dude, after allowing these guys to come back, you fucking deserve to get smacked the next night. Boss, your thoughts on game six? You have a lead for a reason. You're not supposed to blow this. Blake Snell uh, was, was coaching, you know, the first four innings of this, man. It was like, okay, he was like he's in the zone. We know Blake Snell. Uh, it's been a Cy Young caliber official over the last couple of years. Hell of a pitcher, young guy, got great stuff, can change speed, has a pinpoint location, and it just, the wheels just fell off. And credit to the Astros, the Astros were doing simple base hitting. They weren't trying to hit the long ball. They got guys on base. They were able to keep hitting it up the middle, getting sack flies, and they did all the little things it took. Um, to really win the game. I mean, Dusty Baker was pulling out all the stops, you know, whether it's bunting, hit and run, all those things that seem, that are seen to be old school to a lot of people, especially these analytic jerks and geeks that love to talk about the numbers. Man, those old school things, they do factor in baseball. And they were able to handle business. I think the Rays were just shell-shocked when that, I believe it was a 4-1 inning occurred. And then, you know, the next few innings, you know, they were able to tack on more runs. And before you know it, it's 7-1. to one. It was just 1-0 to nothing going to the fifth. And then you look at the bottom of the seventh, you're down 7-1. to one. I mean, they were just absolutely discombobulated. They looked bewildered. They looked like they had seen a ghost. And if you're a person like me, I was really scared that this series was over. Because the last time we've seen this team come back from 3-0 to force a game seven, was 16 years ago. I was in my college dorm. It was kind of funny. Now, just take you guys back to the story. Uh, my good friend Chris is from the East Coast. He's a Red Sox fan. He was down three to nothing, and I told him, you know, with the hatred in this series with you guys, I wouldn't be surprised if you came back and just won this series. Oh, it's over. I'm like, ah, you know, weird things happen in baseball. Baseball is the most unpredictable game ever because there's not a clock. And I was thinking, well, the Astros. You know, much maligned and talked about that they were cheaters and that they were just frauds. Man, is this their year to just stop everybody? Uh, going to Game 7. Game 7, the best words in all of pro sports, but the scariest words are Rays fans and everybody who hates the fucking Astros. No doubt. <laughs> 
No doubt there on that one. And would the Astros somehow, some way, pull off the victory in this Game 7 and continue to wave their middle finger at the rest of the baseball world? Or would Tampa Bay be able to right their ship and move on to their first World Series appearance since 2008? Let's take a look right here, right now, and see what happened in Game 7 of the 2020 ALCS, which, of course, went down on Saturday, October the 17th. Tampa would score first in this contest when they would score the first two runs of the game in the bottom of the first. They would also score a single run in the bottom of the second and what would ultimately be their final run of the game in the bottom of the sixth. Tampa would have some late life in this one as they would score two runs in the bottom, or excuse me, two runs in the top of the eight, but would not be able to muster anything after that as finally Tampa, after three games, doing what they probably should have done in game four, but ultimately finally doing it, doing the baseball world a solid, and defeating the Houston Astros, finally, in Game 7, winning the Series 4-3, and moving on to the World Series as they take this game by the final of 4-2. to two. Tampa Bay, four runs, six hits, no errors. Houston, two runs, seven hits, and no errors in this contest. Morton picking up the win for Tampa Bay. McCullers taking the loss for the Astros. And Fairbanks picking up the save for Tampa Bay in this one. And just, man... I don't know if, how many of y'all out there saw some of the uh, reactions aqu- across Twitter after it happened. Some pretty hilarious ones out there, including the one my main man, the boss man, threw up with that picture of the three Spider-Men. Basically, it's basically the Falcons, the Braves, and the Georgia Bulldogs all pointing at each other, blaming them for you know continuing to drop the ball um, in the postseason. But just, man, very intense, great seven-game series matchup. Definitely great to see the uh, Astros get bounced. Just it, it's crazy, man, because you you know you had p- some people out there. Uh, one post or one tweet that I saw out there is that uh, from somebody was that they were honestly on the verge of getting ready to say screw baseball had the Astros won. But luckily, we didn't have to worry about that because Tampa did us a solid. Boss, your thoughts on Game Seven of the ALCS? Randy. Or Zarena. That's the story. You know, Les McCullers, who the A's got, got the hit pretty well in game one of the ALDS, hit the first batter of the game. You're just like, oh, shit. Here he comes. And, you know, he threw uh, that, kind of, that kind of sinker. Um, and uh, as Zarena was found it off, and he was at, they did a breakdown of it afterward. Jimmy Rollins was really him and Pedro Martinez, they, they gave great insight. They showed him sliding down, looking at the pitch. He's seeing the depth of the pitch and where he needs to connect on it. And he caught that 97-mile-per-hour sinker, and he sipped it a long way, you know, well over 400 feet. I think that set the tone. And then, you know, uh, my boy uh, Drake, uh, Drake 206, representing uh, up there in uh, the M City, man, his former guy, Mike Zanino, who he told me the other day, they brought him up too early, you know, and he never really get found his footing. Well, good to see a guy like that work hard and, and find his place down there in uh, Tampa. But he was able to get a 430-foot blast. I'm talking about when he gets all of it, he gets all of it. A lot of power in the, in the young man. Uh, he's better now, but still a young man. Uh, you know, that put the Rays up 3 nothing, and that gave them a cushion. I thought the key point of the game, a lot of people thought it was super. You saw they were showing Twitter reactions that they would have kept Charlie Morton. And Charlie Morton pitched fantastic. And the A's fans, we've got to see Charlie Morton all, obviously, with the Astros. But we definitely saw him last year in the wild card game. Excellent pitcher. Excellent veteran. Uh, he pitched game seven in that tainted 2017 World Series uh, at Dodger Stadium. Uh, got a lot of control as a game plan. A uh, veteran savvy guy like that is really tough to deal with. The Astros hitters were off balance, and they took him out after 66 pitches. He was dealing, but I thought it was the best move of the game for manager Kevin Cash. And I put on Twitter, are you guys uh, questioning him now? Because he took him out, and he brought in, I believe it was uh, the Anderson kid, brought him out, and they were able to get out the end. He was with two out. Pitch five and two thirds. He, he's giving you all you uh, you can ask for. I mean, you know, it, it, in that situation, you got men on first and third or what have you. And what if the Astros, a team who has dynamite offense, they can score in bunches real fast? You just saw, saw it the day before. Blake Snell pitched a 
a great first four innings, then all of a sudden they got a hold of his ass. You know, you take him out, you have this vaunted bullpen. It's so highly validated by a lot of baseball experts. Hell, this is game seven. You go for what you know. You go with them. And they didn't disappoint, even though that Apple able scored two runs. Um, you know, Fairbanks came in, still made it happen in the ninth, and they're going to the second World Series. I, I'm really happy, uh, even though we're not a small market, but we're considered an underdog team, low payroll, for a reason I still will never get. But you, you're happy for teams like the Rays. You know, and especially the fact that they're in another World Series, I hope that they win no matter who they play with, the Dodgers or the Braves, because I don't want that team to move to Montreal, even though I suspect that they're trying to move somewhere. But they shouldn't They, they shouldn't be moving uh, the Rays. Uh, the problem is it has them in fucking St. Petersburg. On the other side, away from everybody, they're not even near Ybor City, where they kind of want to build at, uh, what, I'm, what I'm told. But you need to have them up near the hub where people are at kicking it. Tampa is a lively place, just like Central Florida is. The Rays need to be close to downtown. The Stanley Cup champion, the uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning, where do they play at? Downtown, and it's always a great time. They have all kind of concerts and all kind of things going on in downtown Tampa. Give the Rays a chance. Give them a chance for success. I hope they win this World Series or you know, I wouldn't mind. Put it this way. I mean, whoever wins, wins. I'm not going to have a vested interest in it like that. But it would be a good thing if they won and they were able to get some momentum for a stadium in downtown. So uh, a great series. Astros are hard, but here's the real truth. Dusty Baker, don't matter the city. It's the same result, man. You just can't get it done. Well, with Washington before this, uh, the Reds blowing a two blowing a two zero lead and losing three straight games at home in twenty twelve to the Giants. Uh, they also lost, I think, uh, the following year. Uh, it was against the Pirates, right? When Johnny Cueto uh, uh, pitched pretty awful in Pittsburgh. Uh, you have the, the Cubs fiasco, man, just just blowing it with the Cubs. Terrible. The Giants blowing it. This guy's been, you know, five different places. The same result happens. When is Dusty Baker not going to be a manager? Dusty Baker has no business being a manager in today's game. Yes, he has some old school tactics. But he had a talented team, as you know, anyway, in Houston. You know, they cheated, but they still have some talent on that team. Dusty Baker is not the guy to lead a team anywhere. But to another playoff disappointment. That's all I got to say on AL. I'm actually not surprised that you uh, brought up the uh, the Dusty Baker facts right there, and I, I know so, I forgot who it was. Somebody on our Facebook page questioned that stuff, but you know, hey, you y'all know how we roll at this show. We speak the truth. We call it how we see it, and facts are facts. Dusty Baker doesn't get it done in the postseason, regardless of how good a manager he is. And I also find it funny too that you mentioned the whole talk of the future of the Rays in Tampa Bay, because that's actually a segment that I have planned to uh, discuss later on in this broadcast. Boss, I know uh, you got to get rolling here uh, late night over there with the uh, Boss family, so let me go ahead and get ready to cut you loose and let you lead us into our first break of the night with your final thoughts of the evening. People, on Thursday night, we're going to see a real spectacle. We're going to have the second presidential debate. Donald Trump and Joe Biden going head to head for the last time because in two weeks there's going to be an election. A lot of controversy, mail-in ballots, voter suppression, long lines, yada, da, yada, yada. But the most interesting thing that we're going to see on Thursday is the commission on the debate, uh, debate rules or whatever, regulations. They're going to mute the mics. I'm going to tell you it right now. And I told you guys uh, a couple of weeks ago that if Biden stands strong, he's going to get a boost in his um, numbers, which he did. Because Trump was just talking over him. Donald Trump meltdown is going to come. He's going to attack Hunter Biden. He's going to talk about Ukraine. Even though there's really no... He's got a lot of uh, substantial stuff with that, man. He's going to melt down when his mic is cut. That's 
Trump is going to blow a gasket. It's going to happen. He's a hothead, and another hothead knows what a hothead will do. I'm talking about myself. I'm a hothead. I'm a person that doesn't like to get pressed too much, or when it comes to stuff like that, where it feels like I'm being censored and all that, I explode. I'm at least honest about it. Donald Trump is not honest about it. People, it's going to happen. Just wait for it. It's a 90-minute debate. Man, he won't last 45 minutes. It, he can't take it, people. Guys like him, guys like me, we can't take it. If somebody is going to crowd us into a space, we're going to explode, we're going to let loose. So, people, enjoy, take care. The Tampa Bay Rays going up against the National League team, I won't say who, because Keith is going to be breaking it down. Tampa Bay Rays in six. <laughs> the boss man, ladies and gentlemen, boss, thank you again as always for checking in, regardless of how long it can be, uh, depending on what you got going on. Take care, man. Enjoy the rest of your night. Before, of course, uh, I get ready to take you all into our first break of the evening and uh, drive you all insane uh, solo for the remainder of this broadcast, just my final thoughts on this ALCS. Um, great to see Tampa Bay come out on top. It's a team, obviously, that a lot of people uh, – Kind of look at, and you can see they use kind of a little bit of a similar philosophy and style um, to us to some extent and have a lower payroll than us. Or, you know, I don't know. It seems like sometimes maybe we flow around stuff. Obviously, we all know we got the fourth richest owner in baseball, should spend more, but we have the same payroll as these bastards. And yet again, just like they did back in uh, 2008, overcoming the odds. Uh, and diversity and uh, the craziness this year of, of course, a shortened season because of a global pandemic and uh, knocking out and taking down, though granted they should have did it in game four, but took the full seven and obviously, let, let's be real, I enjoy when playoff baseball goes the full series because it just makes things way more interesting regardless of how I feel about these teams. So yeah, they should have gotten it done in four, but hey, Tampa got the deal done in seven, and as I mentioned, did us all in the baseball world a solid and uh, knocked the Astros out. And, uh, hey, Astros fans, welcome to the couch. You accomplished the same thing that we did. You lasted a round longer, same consequence, same outcome, you hitting the golf links early. So, ha-ha, screw you. Carlos Correa, you need to shut your mouth and stop running it. Jose Altuve, you know, got to figure it out ultimately and you know it's gonna be real interesting to see how things you know move forward with that squad down there in Houston if they're gonna be able to keep some of those pieces if they're gonna go out and bring in some other pieces you know and it's gonna be real interesting you know not just to watch you know moves that are made by these teams that still were in the postseason that are making on the World Series as mentioned because of the strain and economics that have impacted the game because of the virus. It's going to be real interesting to see what moves in general are made, period, all across the baseball world. So congrats to the Tampa Bay Rays and their fans down there in Tampa uh, as they head off to their second World Series in franchise history. First time, of course, that the Rays have punched a ticket to the Fall Classic since they did it back in 2008. And that wraps up things for the ALCS uh, on this playoff edition of A's Fan Radio. But that, of course, is not the end of the playoff talk. Is hey, I got a whole nother championship series I still got to recap. We come back from our first break of the night, ladies and gentlemen. We will take a look at what went down in the NLCS between the Atlanta Braves and the Los Angeles Dodgers. We, of course, also, before the night is over with, we'll preview the 2020 World Series matchup. I, of course, will share my take and thoughts on how the, the potential... Uh, winning of this World Series by Tampa Bay could impact their future in the Tampa region. Um, my final thoughts, of course, will come later on in the show. And, of course, we do have a fan question of the night out there for y'all to answer. So make sure to uh, make your way over to Facebook.com slash A's Fan Radio or our Twitter page at A's underscore fan underscore radio and submit your response to the fan question of the night, which, of course, I will read before my final thought at the end of the show. The fan question of the night for this edition of AFR is we want to hear your take on what went down with the championship series and also who do you got? winning the 2020 World Series. NLCS recap coming right at you following the first break of the night here on show number 278, the playoff editions of A's Fan Radio. If I can get the music started. <laughs> I am 
the Great Cornhoyo, and you are listening to your number one source for everything and anything on your Oakland Athletics A's Fan Radio. Now, surrender your TP, because I need to wipe up me bunghole. Mm, bunghole. Mm, fuck the Astros. Mm, TP from my bunghole. Man, it's been a while since that caffeinated jackass has popped in here on the show. I guess he uh, finally figured out where the new Dub6 Studios was located. So, yeah, Cornholio dropping by, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome back as we continue to roll on down the road here with show number 278, the playoff editions of your number one source for everything and anything on your Oakland Athletics A's fan radio. It is, of course, the legally 5150 corporate right field asshole coming at you from the new Dub6 Studios located up in the Eastmont Hills overlooking the Oakland Coliseum and the rest of the Deep East. Main man, the boss man, joined me uh, briefly to uh, share his thoughts on the ALCS and uh, just check in with y'all on things. I, of course, now will be coming at you solo for the remainder of this broadcast. And just one more time real quickly before we get on in to recapping the National League Championship Series again, want to make sure to remind y'all that we do have a fan question of the night posted on our social media pages. So, hey, here's the opportunity for y'all to have uh, your thoughts, questions, opinions, bitches, or complaints, whatever you want to call them, heard during the course of this show. Because remember, hey, it is A's Fan Radio. Yes, even though primarily it's myself and Boss and whoever the hell else joins us running our mouths. A's Fan Radio. It's about the fans, damn it. So make sure that you make your way over to either Facebook.com slash A's Fan Radio or our Twitter page at A's underscore fan underscore radio and submit your response to tonight's fan question of the night, which, of course, is we want to hear your thoughts on what went down during the AL and NL Championship Series matchups. And we also want to hear who do you got taking the 2020 Fall Classic. Of course, when we, uh, we left off with you prior to our uh, – First break of the evening, we, of course, already found out who punched their ticket from the American League side as the uh, Tampa Bay Rays will be heading to their second uh, World Series in franchise history. First trip to the Fall Classic for them, again, as mentioned, since 2008. They, of course, would uh, have to wait to find out on who they would be playing as, of course, the other championship series uh, that went down in this postseason, the National League Championship Series, just like the ALCS. It ultimately would take seven games to determine who would be punching their ticket to the Fall Classic from the NL side of things. That NLCS uh, matchup, of course, featured the AL East, or excuse me, the NL East Atlanta Braves, and of course, the top seeded team in the National League, the Los Angeles Dodgers. Let's go ahead now and take a look at what went down over the course of this best of seven National League series, which of course was played at Globe Life Field down there in Arlington, Texas, the ballpark, of course, that will also serve as the neutral site for the 2020 World Series. Here's what went down in Game 1 of this best of seven NLC mat- NLCS matchup between the Braves and the Dodgers. The Dodgers, of course, being the home team for the first two games of this best of seven series. Game 1, of course, going down back on Monday, October the 12th. Atlanta would drop the first run of this game in this contest when they would plant a single run on the Dodgers in the top of the first. That would be the only run that would be scored until about the midway point when the Dodgers would finally tie up the game with a single run in the bottom of the fifth inning. Unfortunately for Los Doyers, that would be the only run that they would score in this contest as uh, Atlanta would go on to drop a four spot on the Dodgers pitchers in the top of the ninth and take the first game of this best of seven NLCS series, uh, winning it by the final of five to one. Atlanta five runs, eight hits, no errors. Los Angeles one run, four hits, and no errors in this contest. Smith picking up the win for the Braves. Former Oakland Athletic Blake uh, Blake Trinan getting tagged with the L for LA in this contest. Home runs in this one uh, on the uh, um, damn. I almost said the Astros. Sorry about that. Too many A's in this damn. Uh, too many teams with A's in this bloody postseason that aren't the A's. Anyway. Atlanta, home runs in this one. You had Freddie Freeman going deep, Riley going deep, and Abili, uh, God, was that? Albias, I believe, going deep as well. The only home run for the Dodgers in this game, and, of course, their lone run of the contest uh, coming off the bat of Kiki Hernandez. So not very uh, looking good. Not a good – well, I shouldn't say not looking good in that case. Not um, obviously the start that fans of the uh, L.A. team – we're looking for, but you know, again, top seeded team, 
only one game. Shouldn't mean really much of anything. You could easily get yourself back into things. At least you would think that to be the case. Would that be the case, however? Let's go and find out if the uh, the Dodgers were able to tie this series up at two games apiece, or excuse me, tie it up at one game apiece, um, or if the Braves would jump out to an early 2-0 lead. Here's what went down in Game 2 of the NLCS on Tuesday, October the 13th. The first runs of this game would not come until almost nearly the midway point when Atlanta would drop the first two runs of the game in the top of the fourth. They would also have a four-run spot in the top of the fifth and a single run in the top of the seventh before the Dodgers would finally score their first three runs of the game in the bottom of that seventh inning. The Braves would tack on what would be their final run of the contest in the top of the ninth, while the Dodgers would go on to score four runs in the bottom of that ninth inning, but it wouldn't be enough to add up to tie or win the game as Atlanta jumps out to the early 2-0 lead in this NLCS, defeating the Dodgers in Game 2 by the final of 8-7. Atlanta, 8 runs, 10 hits, 1 error. Los Angeles, 7 runs, and 10 hits in this contest. Uh, let's see here. Marteziki picking up the win for the Braves, and uh, Gonzalez taking the loss for the Dodgers. Uh, Melikon picking up the save for the Braves in this contest. Home runs in this one, you have Freddie Freeman go, uh, going deep in back-to-back contests, and uh, Albias going deep in back-to-back contests, as well as two gentlemen that, of course, homered in the first game, homered for Atlanta again in the second game. Over on the Dodgers' side, you had uh, Corey Seager hitting a home run, and former Oakland Athletic Max Muncy going deep as well in the contest. So early 2-0 lead, hmm, is what it is. Um, obviously, if you're a Braves fan, you're – you know, probably up on cloud nine at this point thinking, hey, maybe we have a chance to bounce the Dodgers out of this thing early. You're a Dodgers fan, probably a little pissed off, but hey, you know that it ain't over until Fat Lady sings. It ain't over until one of these teams has four wins in this series. And um, I think that after what went down in the first two games, the um, the Dodgers would show up um as the, uh, obviously, of course, the road team for these next uh, three games, starting with this Game 3 matchup. Let's just say that after those first two games, Los Doyers were pretty fucking mad. And that outcome would show here in Game 3 of the NLCS, which, of course, went down on Wednesday, October the 14th. Man, crazy intense first inning. As basically all but four of the runs that the Dodgers would score in this contest would be scored in the top of the first inning. You want to know how many runs they scored if you somehow weren't watching this game? Ladies and gentlemen, they dropped my jersey number in the first inning. The Dodgers scored 11 freaking runs in the top of the first inning to start off this Game 3 contest. First time that's ever happened in a postseason. And uh, I want to say the majority of those runs actually ended up coming with, uh, with two outs, if um, I remember, but just... L.A. teeing off big time on Braves pitchers with, again, an 11-run spot in the top of that first inning. They then would score one run in the top of the second, and then what would be their final three runs of the contest um, in the top of the third. So basically, L.A. doing all of their scoring in the first third of this of this game. Um, yeah, you know, kind of a little hard to come back from that. And as you would see, the Braves wouldn't really be able to muster anything back from that outside of a single run in the bottom of the third and uh, what would be their final two runs of the game um, in the bottom of the ninth. So again, after scoring all their runs over the course of the first three innings of this contest, the Los Angeles Dodgers go on to beat the Braves um, in this one by the final of 15-3. to three. So yeah, football score. You know, ain't like it's the first time we've seen that happen in any of the games this year, but just, you know, it's even, you know, it's just insane when you see a score like that in a postseason game. So, yeah, 15-3 to L.A. winning this as they uh, take their first W of the NLCS and uh, reduce the Braves' lead in the series to 2-1. to L.A. in this contest, 15 runs, 16 hits, no errors. Atlanta, 3 runs, 7 hits, and no errors during the course of this Game 3 contest. Uh, you're always picking up the win for the Dodgers right getting tagged with a loss uh, in this contest. Home runs, man. Pfft. Like I said, you know, a good, you know, not obviously all the runs coming off that, but a good majority of the run, of those 11 runs in the first inning coming off of ding-dong doodles. You had Jock Peterson hitting one. You had Rios hitting one. You had Max Muncy hitting a grand slam um, in that uh, top of the first inning. 
Uh, Cody Bellinger went deep also, and then uh, Corey Seager for the second game in a row going deep for Los Doyers. Uh, Patch Pichy being the only home run for Atlanta uh, in this contest. And, you know, got to feel bad, for, you know, kind of loosely maybe feel bad for right in this one. Only lasted two-thirds uh, in this game three start for Atlanta, um, basically taking the brunt and blow of that matchup there. And just, you know, God, crazy, dude. Seeing 11 runs scored in one inning. You know, it, it's ridiculous and intense and insane seeing that happen in the regular season. It's even more ridiculous and intense seeing that go down in the postseason. As mentioned, first time it's ever happened um, in a playoff. So, hey, all these years of baseball and you're still having firsts going down in the sport. It's crazy. Just it is how it is. With that note, let's go ahead and take a look at what went down in game four of this best of seven NLCS matchup. And, of course, if we thought that the Dodgers were mad after going down 2-0, just wonder how the Braves felt after getting smacked around and having 15 runs scored on them in game three. Let's see if uh, the Dodgers would be able to knock this series up at two games or if Atlanta would be able to exact a little bit of revenge for what went down the previous night in Game 3. Here's what went down in Game 4 on Thursday, October the 15th. Las Doyers would drop the first run of the game in the top of the third when they would score a single run. That lead would only last about an inning and a half, though, when, of course, in the bottom of the fourth inning, the Braves would tie the game up at one all with a single run. The Braves would then take the lead for good in the bottom of the sixth inning when they would drop a six-run spot on it, on the Dodgers in the bottom half of that inning. Both teams would each score a single run in the seventh, and Atlanta would go on to score what would be their final two runs of the contest in the bottom of the eighth. They would hold the Dodgers to goose eggs for the final two innings of this game as they, of course, jump out to a 3-1 series lead after winning this Game 5 contest by the final of 10 to two. Atlanta, 10 runs, 14 hits, no errors. Los Angeles, two runs, three hits, and two errors in this contest. Wilson picking up the win for the Braves. Kershaw getting tagged with the loss for the Dodgers in this one. Home runs in this contest. Rio hitting the only long ball for the Dodgers in this one, while you had Ozuna hit two for the Braves in this contest. And so, unfortunately, the postseason woes continue to drag on for one Clayton Kershaw. And I mean, just it, it's something that we've continuously seen and heard about and seen from this gentleman, unfortunately. He's a great, he's a guy that's, you know, lights out, dominates, you know, obviously doesn't have, you know, blow away, fry your ass type gas, but obviously has done what he's needed to do since coming into the league to dominate and shut down the opposition in the regular season. Yet somehow, some way, he cannot translate that into success in the postseason for the Dodgers. I mean, he's had a few bright spots here and there where he's had had some postseason you know, success. But, hey, for you Dodger fans out there listening, let, let's be real. More often than not, somehow, some way, Clayton finds a way to drop the ball in the postseason. And it's something that he's going to really need to turn around and um, – obviously show everyone outside of LA that that's not the case because I'm pretty sure a lot of you out there that are Dodger fans and probably have uh, buddies from up here in the Bay Area or from around the country that follow that damn Halloween colored team over there that's the one thing that you always are here constantly hearing about from them is yeah Kershaw does a great season da, 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 da. can't do shit in the postseason da, 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 da. so Clayton you, you got to correct that or you know Fans outside of L.A. are just going to continue to ride your ass until you prove that you can actually dominate in the postseason. Well, that would, of course, set things up for basically the Dodgers to win or head to the couch. Would they be able to pull out a victory? Or would the Atlanta Braves end up punching a ticket to the World Series? Let's find out right now what went down in Game 5 of the 2020 NLCS on Friday, October the 16th. Atlanta would score first in this contest as they would score one run in the bottom of the second, or excuse me, one run in the bottom of the first and also one run in the bottom of the second. Kind of getting a little ahead of myself out there as they jumped out to an early 2-0 lead in this contest. The Dodgers, though, would have an answer for them and would uh, make things interesting and yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Anyway, <laughs> the Dodgers would score their first run of the game to come within one in the fourth inning and then would take the lead and add on to the lead with three runs in the top of the sixth 
and three runs in the top of the seventh. Those uh, runs in the top of the seventh being their final runs of the contest. The Atlanta Braves would only be able to muster out one single run after those first two runs early in the game. That one run coming across in the bottom of the eighth inning as the Dodgers live to fight another day and take game five of the NLCS by the final of seven to three. Los Angeles, seven runs, nine hits, no errors. Atlanta, three runs, seven hits, and no errors in this contest. Blake Trident, after getting tagged with the loss in the first game of this NLCS, comes back to get the W in this game five matchup, while Smith got tagged for the loss on the Atlanta side of things. Home runs in this contest over on the LA side, you had Corey Seager hitting two long balls in this contest, and uh, Smith also hitting a long ball for the Dodgers in this one. No home runs for the Atlanta Braves in this contest. So, hey, Dodger fans, you live to fight another day. You know what that means? you got to basically do it yet again, not just in the next game, but for the next two games, basically, at this point. And uh, let's go and take a look right here right now and see if uh, the Dodgers would live to fight another day or if the Braves would punch their damn ticket to the World Series. Here's what went down in Game 6 of the NLCS on Saturday, October the 17th. And, of course, with this matchup, the Dodgers revert back to being the home team. L.A. would score first in this contest when they would drop three runs on Atlanta in the bottom of the third inning. That's all they would score the rest of the way, uh, <laughs> over the course of this one, as L.A. would uh, have nothing but goose eggs for the next eight innings of the game. But it was all good, though, because over the course of those same innings, Atlanta was only able to score one bloody run. That single run of theirs, of course, coming in the top of the seventh as the Dodgers win and live to fight another day and also tie the NLCS up at three games apiece as they take this game six matchup by the final of three to one. LA three runs, nine hits, one error, ATL one run, nine hits, and no errors in this game six contest. Bueller, Bueller, Bueller! Picking up the win for L.A. in this contest. While Fried, Freed, may as well be Fried because he probably got fried by L.A. in this one. Taking the loss for uh, the Braves in this one. And Jansen picking up the save for Los Doyers in this one. No home runs for the Braves in this contest. And, man, Corey Seager just caught fire in, in this NLCS as he goes deep yet again. Um, what is this, third, fourth game? You know, seems like basically after game two, he pretty much has been going deep um, as he hits another long ball in this NLCS matchup. And you also had Turner going deep for a sol- um, for a solo shot, or excuse me, a, yeah, solo shot for the Dodgers in this one. So, hey, just like the ALCS, you get the full, all the games. Just like the ALCS, baby. In the words of one Zaza Pachulia, it would take, A game seven to ultimately decide who would be punching their ticket from the NL side. Would it be the ATL? Would it be Los Doyers? Let's find out right here, right now, what went down yesterday in Arlington, Texas to decide who would represent the National League in the Fall Classic. Here's what went down in game seven of the NLCS between the ATL and the real LA team. Because, of course, we all know that other team down there. The Clemson are from L.A. is not from L.A. Anyway, here's what went down between the Braves and the Dodgers in Game 7. Atlanta would score first in this contest as it would score a single run in the top of the first as well as a single run in the top of the second. That lead would be short-lived for an inning, however, as immediately in their half of the third inning, the Dodgers would tie up the game with a two-run spot. Atlanta would retake the lead back, though, with a single run in the top of the fourth inning, Unfortunately for them, and unfortunately for Braves fans everywhere, that would be the last one that they would score in this contest, and it wouldn't be enough to uh, secure the victory for them. The Dodgers, on the other hand, they would tie the game up with, at three runs each with a single run in the bottom of the sixth and would take the lead for good with a single run in the bottom of the seventh as the Dodgers live on after being down 3-1 themselves, come back to win three straight games, or excuse me, yeah, three straight games. Just want to make sure I had my math right. The Dodgers coming down from a 3-1 hole themselves and able to pull off what the Asterisks couldn't do and bounce the Braves, beat them in Game 7, and punch their ticket to the 2020 Fall Classic. The Atlanta, uh, excuse me, the Los Angeles Dodgers 
clinching the NLCS with a victory in Game 7 by the final of 4-3. to three. LA four runs, 10 hits, no errors. Atlanta three runs, three hits, and no errors in the deciding game seven matchup. Uris taking the win for the Dodgers. Martin taking the L for the ATL in this one. Home runs in this one. Swanson hitting the only home run for the Braves in this one. It's also the first time that a major league shortstop in either the American League or the National League has hit a home run in a game seven in the postseason since Campy Campaneras did it in the 1973 World Series against the New York Mets. So a little bit of baseball history going on there. Nice to see that it's some history that, hey, the last time it happened, it was an Oakland athletic that did it. Over on the uh, Dodgers side of things, Kiki Hernandez hitting the uh, what would basically be the, uh, if I remember correctly, the home run that would tie the game up. And, of course, you had Cody Bellinger hitting what would be the go-ahead game-clinching home run in the seventh inning. So the Dodgers... Heading to the Fall Classic yet again for, what is this, the third time in fourth years or just some crazy number like that. Um, Obviously, uh, certain certain fans of a team across the bay are probably not too thrilled to to see that. It's kind of a mixed uh, reaction from members of the A's fan base since obviously we got some people out there that are part of that ridiculous split crowd or just for some reason you know, just don't like the Dodgers, which to some extent is understandable because some of you out there probably still harbor hard feelings from that 1988 World Series. And hey, I don't own, I don't blame you. I was three years old. And to this day, I still get pissed off every time I see a certain uh, gimpy individual's uh, home run replay um, get played. So it's kind of understandable why some of the A's fan base um, wouldn't want to see the Dodgers advance. You know, I obviously, of course, those of you all out there that know me know that I got several friends out there that are you know, lifelong Dodger fans. One of those, of course, being our uh, our good friend Christian, who y'all know is uh, at Black Seth Rogan on Twitter. Uh, you know, one of the rare uh, Dodger A's fan combos out there. And then, of course, my street sis, who was uh, born and raised out in Lancaster, um, lifelong Dodger fan herself. Uh, surprised she hasn't tried calling me to try to recruit me to the Dodger bandwagon like she basically has the last, uh, what is it, three or four years now, whenever the A's have gotten bounced or not making the postseason. She basically... Um, tries to recruit her brother's um, craziness over to that side. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, man, so um, obviously they're feeling happy down there in L.A., um, hopefully wa- uh, waiting to see uh, another team bring L.A. another championship. As of course, we all know the Los Angeles Lakers just recently wrapped up winning the, uh, the NBA uh, championship uh, in their uh, abbreviated playoffs because of COVID and their shortened season because of COVID. Um, obviously, you know, would be great down there for the LA area for them to get it. Cause it's a team that, Hey, they've been to a bunch of world series since that 1988 matchup with the A's, but that matchup in 1988 was the last time that the Dodgers won a world series. So, you know, they're looking at damn near almost, you know, a, what is it? You know, we haven't seen a title here in 31 years, you know, a little over a year longer for them, basically roughly the same amount of time in between, you know, title wins for them. But obviously the one difference being that they've actually played in a couple World Series since the last time they went in the 80s, um, where in our case, we haven't been to a series since 1990. Uh, Hopefully that changes in the future, but who knows about that. So congratulations out there to the Los Angeles Dodgers and their fans. And uh, as we already mentioned, obviously, congratulations to the uh, the Tampa Bay Rays also, um, as of course now with this. That finalizes and sets up things with the National League um, Championship Series wrapping up and, of course, sets the tone for what will be the matchup for the 2020 World Series. And we will take a look and preview that World Series when we come back at you here with our next break on the show. Don't go anywhere. And, of course, remember, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't yet done so, be sure to make your way over to Facebook.com slash A's Fan Radio or at A's underscore Fan underscore Radio on Twitter and respond to our fan question of the night for this show, which, of course, I will read you all responses at the end of tonight's broadcast. Tonight's fan question of the night, once again, of course, is we want to hear your thoughts on what went down in these um, NL and AL championship series, and who do you think will be raising the commissioner's trophy when the fall classic is all said and done? We, of course, again, will preview that 2020 World Series matchup between the Los Angeles Dodgers and the Tampa Bay Rays when we come back from this next commercial break here on show number 278, the playoff editions of A's. Fan Radio.
And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, as we continue to roll on down the road here with your number one source for everything and anything on your Oakland Athletics. Even though our beloved Oakland Athletics um, got bounced from the postseason, what was it, a little over a week and a half, two weeks ago? And don't even remember, no. Just bottom line is we got bounced. It sucks. But even though the A's aren't in the playoffs anymore, we are continuing to roll on forward with the ball here on A's Talk from the fans' point of view as we continue our postseason coverage and game recaps and all that jolly good stuff here on show number 278, the playoff editions of A's Fan Radio. And for those of you that are probably, you know, wondering why do I keep sometimes saying that like that, um, obviously you're all familiar with the uh, where that phrase originated from but of course those of you that f- have followed this show since its incarnation uh, and birth back in 2003 many of you of course know that Chris Dobbins liked to use that catchphrase a lot whenever playoff talk at all was brought up um, on A's fan radio back in the day so obviously try to continue that on carry that little bit uh, on over there sorry though y'all I'm not going to do the damn mama joke of your week that was strictly Chris Dobbins and that will remain uh, Chris Dobbins and uh, obviously you know definitely need to look at trying to bring uh, Dobbins to pop back in at some point down the road but you know we all know Chris is busy and tied up in god who knows what nowadays it just it seems like you know it's an adventure trying to get a hold of him at some point but you know shout out of course to uh, chris dobbins the co-creator co-founder of this uh podcast it's been running amok on internet radio for 17 years and counting now um founded of course by chris and francis brooks uh two cal berkeley alumni who knew each other during their time at cal and of course in 2011 they passed off the reins to yours truly and we've been running amok back on the air for nine years now and damn it's just crazy next next year is gonna mark 10 years since the return of the show in 10 years with my cuckoo ass um running it and just you know been a great ride definitely looking forward to continue riding it and you know just definitely we'll look forward to obviously trying to get you know some of the old members back on like i said be great to bring chris back on be great to bring francis back in uh be great to get a lot of the old cast members to try to pop in every now and then but obviously a lot of us you know are got a lot of stuff going on are doing different stuff in our lives now than we were back when we started this show 17 years ago so even though a lot of you know and even some of the guys that make up the current cast right now you know obviously probably a lot of y'all would love to hear from them as well you know you know I'm pretty sure y'all don't get tired of just me or just myself and boss man but you know some of you out there are probably thinking when are we gonna hear from Tito again when's Dano gonna drop in when are we gonna get to hear ballistic bullshit with ballistic Bill well I'm probably gonna give Bill a call or hit him up in the next couple of days just to check in on what he's doing and maybe try to get him to pop in on a show at some point here during the off season let's go ahead and continue on down the road with uh, postseason coverage here on A's Fan Radio, as we, of course, now are going to preview the 2020 World Series. And, of course, for those of you that somehow have not been paying attention to things or have not realized it, what's been going on, just like the rest of this postseason, the World Series will remain in the bubble and will be at a neutral site. That neutral site, of course, being Globe Life uh, Park, Field, whatever the hell they want to call the uh, the stadium that looks like a feed barn on HGH down there in Arlington, Texas. Uh, same ballpark, of course, where the uh, National League Series uh, just wrapped up yesterday. That 2020 World Series matchup, of course, will feature the number one seeded team in the American League, taking on the number one seeded team in the National League. Kind of, you know, the way you would envision most playoff setups to uh, be, regardless of how you feel about uh, the teams playing in there. Those teams, of course, being the number one seeded AL champion Tampa Bay Rays and the top seeded NL champion Los Angeles Dodgers. Here's how things are shaping up and the schedule for uh, what will be going down with this best of seven 2020 World Series matchup. The uh, only round in the playoffs that actually will have uh, some day offs, days off mixed in with it is, of course, obviously um, the other rounds not really having any day offs, days off at all whatsoever, except in between rounds. Well, obviously, a lot of that being done because of the games being played in neutral sites and wanting to get the postseason done as quickly as you know scheduling possible because of you know the fact that there are concerns about how uh, and what direction COVID-19 is going to take as we head into the winter months here. But there will actually be some breaks in between uh, these matchups. So here's how things are shaping up. Um, game times, home team, away team, all that good stuff. Here is how the 2020 World Series looks and sets to uh, go down. Game one, of course, will be coming at you tomorrow night 
uh, at 5.09 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, this contest and, of course, all the games of the 2020 World Series, you can watch, of course, on Fox. Game 1, of course, is mentioned tomorrow night, uh, 5.09 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, start time out here on the West Coast. You'll have uh, Glasnow taking uh, the bump for the Rays in this one. He, of course, will face off against Clayton Kershaw, who will get the Game 1 start for the Dodgers in this one. Game 2, which, of course, will be on October the 21st, will be a 5.08 start time, um, 5.08 uh, p.m. Pacific Standard Time start time, I should say. Uh, Blake Snell scheduled to make the start for the Rays. The Dodgers have yet to announce uh, who their Game 2 starter will be. After, of course, an off day on the 22nd, and, of course, um, the uh, home and road team switching for the next three games. Game three, of course, goes down on October the 23rd. That will also be a 5.08 start time, um, uh, 5.08 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, start time there at Globe Life Park. Uh, the Dodgers have announced that uh, Bueller uh, will make the start for them in game three. Tampa Bay has yet to announce who their game three starter will be. Game four will be on October the 24th. That will also be a 5.08 uh, p.m. Pacific tan Standard Time start. Neither team has announced a starter for Game 4 or any of the other games beyond Game 4. Game 5, of course, if it is needed, will go down on October the 25th. That will also be a 5.08 p.m. Pacific Standard Time start. Game 6, of course, uh, if that is needed, and also with that game and the following Game 7, if it's needed, we'll revert back to the Dodgers, of course, being the home team. Uh, game 6, if it's needed, will go down on October the 27th at 5.08 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And if for some bloody-ass ridiculous reason, just like with the ALCS and just like the NLCS, if this potentially, like the championship series, ends up going the full Game 7s, then Game 7, if it ends up going down, would be on October the 28th, and that would be a 5.09 Pacific Standard Time start. And of course, as mentioned, all of the World Series games can be viewed on Fox. Um, probably not the matchup that everybody was expecting um, when 2020 started off. And that's regardless if you were looking at uh, had 2020 played out with a regular 162 game schedule or even with looking at things with the shortened 60 game schedule because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Now, uh, Obviously, maybe some out there were probably penciling in and expecting the Dodgers to be there yet again, representing the National League. Um, just, you know, obviously just, you know, with the money and the resources and everything they got down there, they're a team that is always going to be in the thick of the hunt year in, year out, spending and doing what they got to do to make sure that they're running at or near the top in that wild, wild NL West and, you know, just doing what they got to do to compete, you know, again, be nice to see a certain individual who happens to be the fourth richest owner in baseball do something similar to what they're doing down there up here. But, you know, we've had our talks about that, and I'll save my rants for uh, cheap-ass uh, John Fisher for uh, another day. Uh, so, yeah, many people probably expecting Las Doyers to be in there representing the NL. On the other hand, people probably were not expecting that the Tampa Bay Rays were going to end up being the AL representative. And, you know, it was looked at as, you know, with Tampa Bay as it was probably with a lot of teams that many probably thought this was going to be a year where Tampa was going to be a cellar dweller again. Maybe they would hang out near the middle of the pack, but you know, everyone was expecting it was going to be business as usual out there in the AL East and that either the Yankees or the Red Sox were going to end up finishing on top. And well, that didn't happen in 2020. The, um, the Rays ended up winning the division. The Yankees ended up being a wild card team, which ended up getting bounced by the Rays in the divisional series. And the Red Sox pff, didn't even get anywhere close to sniffing the jock of the postseason in 2020. Um, pff, I don't even think they even got 20 wins in 2020. Come to think of it, just all you know, things going to shit on a shingle basically in Boston in 2020. So very interesting matchup is obviously you got one of the highest payroll teams in baseball in the Dodgers playing against one of the teams that's on the low end of the payroll spectrum in the Rays, and it's going to be extremely interesting to see how this best of seven series ends up playing out. Uh, you already heard Bossman's take in his prediction. He um, expects to see the Rays take this in six games. You know, normally in the past, I'm, I'm not going to lie. 
in, in years past, as I mentioned, I've been recruited by my sister from another mister, uh, who, again, lifelong Dodger fan, grew up down under Lancaster, and even to some extent uh, Christian occasionally in the postseason doing uh, a little bit of stuff to try to court my fandom once the A's got knocked out. Well, sorry to disappoint both of y'all. I'm going to go with the Rays <laughs> this time around. And um, I will pick the Rays winning it in the full seven games just because I want to see some back-and-forth insanity. You know, it's, it's been a crazy 2020 season already, and you've already got to lay in the craziness and the shenanigans of just everything that's been going on in the world up to this point. Why not add to those craziness and shenanigans and have this World Series go the full seven games? So, yeah, Boss predicts them in six, uh, or predicts the Rays in six. I predict the Rays taking this in seven. Some of y'all out there may agree with me and Boss. Some of y'all might not. And look at it, Boss and I, like, we're freaking crazy for not picking the Dodgers to win this. And, you know, at least in my case, I can't speak for Boss, a lot of it's looking back on, you know, the, what they've done in the playoffs. You know, they've gotten that team down there in L.A. that they've obviously been able to go on deep playoff runs year in and year out, but just have been missing that piece or just shooting themselves in the foot where they can't get over that hump. And, you know, to be honest, I'm sick and tired of picking them to win and then having them lose. So I figured, you know, go with the Rays because they're the underdog and win. Or, you know, some of you out there may be thinking, hey, maybe Keith's just lying and he's just choosing to pick the Rays as a reverse psychology to help the Dodgers win finally round up. You, you can believe whatever you want. So, again, I'm picking the Rays to win this in seven. Boss has the Rays winning it in six. And, of course, I'd love to hear from y'all out there on who you think is going to take this World Series and in how many games, because that happens to be part of the fan question of the night, uh, which, again, I'll reiterate, facebook.com slash A's Fan Radio or at A's underscore fan underscore radio on Twitter. And submit your thoughts. I want to hear from y'all who you think is going to take the 2020 Fall Classic. And obviously, along with that, I want to hear y'all's thoughts on uh, how the AL and NLCS uh, played out. And as I get a little bit ahead of ourselves, that's pretty much where we sit at right now as we look back at how uh, things shaped up to where we sit at now with the course of the uh, the 2020 postseason. Obviously, a lot of us out there would have uh, preferred to have seen uh, a certain team's logo that's green on there sitting where Tampa Bay is. And, you know, many out there that were experts uh, actually, as we thought, figured that it was going to be the A's in there. But, hey, unfortunately, the A's doing what they always do and, you know, figuring out a way to just get bounced and uh, But, hey, gives a chance for a team like Tampa Bay to uh, do something. And, again, it will be real interesting to see one way or another how uh, this series plays out. Uh, obviously, a lot writing for Dodger fans in this as they haven't won a World Series since 1988. But I think that there's a lot more writing on things for the Rays in this World Series than it might be for the Dodgers. And what is that, you might wonder? Well, I will get to that when we come back from our next commercial break of the night as of course uh, when I come back from that commercial break I'm going to discuss and take a look at how a potential World Series win for the Rays could possibly finally quell the rumors of them bouncing out of Tampa and secure their future in Tampa that of course coming at you my final thoughts of the night coming later on as well and again I will reiterate it Get your butts over to Facebook.com slash A's Fan Radio or at A's underscore Fan underscore Radio on Twitter. And, hey, submit your responses to the fan question tonight because I want to read them, bad boys, at the end of the show. We want to, of course, hear your thoughts on the AL and NLCS and who do you think is going to win the Fall Classic in 2020 and in how many games. Of course, my take on how this could help out things in Tampa for the Rays if they win the World Series, we come back at you here on show number 278, the Playoff Editions of Ace Fan Radio. Now, some of you, of course, are sitting out there wondering, Corporal, what the hell? I thought you said we were going to have a funk-oriented soundtrack for all the postseason shows going the rest of the way out. Yeah, well, I did say that, but if y'all know me, sometimes when I get into uh, certain moods and start playing certain types of music, I go into my various uh, music bullshit modes, as I like to call them, and uh, let's just say after a little bit of an Ozzy Osbourne and uh, Quiet Riot and Van Halen uh, binge over the weekend that I decided, you know what, I'm going to go with a rock mix for this show. 
Um, obviously, yeah, you all weren't suspecting that. Yes, I know I said it was going to be funk for the playoffs. Sorry about that. I lied. Well, I didn't really lie. I decided to imply and change my mind, I guess you can say. But uh, we'll go back, of course, to the funk mix uh, next week. And a uh, little uh, quick uh, tidbit to throw at you all for the reason why uh, I threw the Four Horsemen into the soundtrack. Uh, some of you all probably saw the post I put out on Twitter and Facebook today um, as I was kicking back and chilling here at the studio early the mo- uh, earlier today. And that post being, of course, what is the most jacked up timeline in movie cinematic history? And why is it the X-Men franchise? Obviously, of course, that song being used in uh, X-Men Apocalypse, which uh, some fans are kind of, you know, split down the middle of. You know, for me, it was a great... St- I like the storyline to uh, X-Men Apocalypse. Just kind of the one thing that always turns me off to the movies. I'm sorry. I don't like the fact that Apocalypse looks like an Ivan Ooze knockoff. And for those of you that don't know who Ivan Ooze was or is, Ivan Ooze, of course, was the, uh, the main villain uh, in the Power Rangers movie that came out back in the 90s so yeah that's why uh y'all heard the four horsemen in there is because my dumb ass was watching uh you know was on an x-men's uh you know x-men binge earlier today and part of last night and yeah and then of course also now you know why i decided to make it a rock mix this week but i will go back to the promised uh funk mix that i was originally planning on bringing y'all for these uh playoff shows and we'll probably do a funk mix for our last regular season show as well before we uh go on a two three week break after our show on november the 5th welcome back ladies and gentlemen this is show number 278 of your number one source for everything and anything on your oakland athletics the playoff editions continue to roll on here at a's fan radio it is of course the legally 5150 Corporal Wrightfield asshole coming at you from the new Dub Six Studios located up in the Eastmont Hills of Oakland, California. The main man, the boss man, uh, joining me briefly during the uh, ALCS recap portion of this uh, show, checking in, of course, from the boss pad in Alameda. As I, of course, uh, mentioned before going into the break, obviously a lot of things writing um, on both sides uh, heading into this 2020 World Series. Uh, You have, obviously, as I mentioned, um, the fans that, of course, make up the Dodgers fan base that are sitting there hoping that this is finally the year after so many missed opportunities and dropping the ball in previous World Series coming up short last year against the Washington Nationals. Is this going to be finally the year where the Dodgers raise the commissioner's trophy for the first time since they beat our boys in green and gold in the 1988 World Series? Or is that team that at one time used to be called the Devil Rays going to be the ones that are out on top and ho- uh, hosting the trophy um, after appearing in their second World Series? Well, you already heard my thoughts and Boss's thoughts on uh, who we feel is going to win this. And now as well, you're going to also hear my take on how a World Series win could possibly secure the long-term future of that team in the Tampa Bay region. Uh, for those of you that may not have been paying attention to some of the stuff that's been going on the last couple of years, um, they've been trying to get a new ballpark built down there in Tampa Bay for pff, forever, basically. It's almost, you know, you, you, you kind of look at what's going on down there and at times it almost looks kind of, you know, not identical, but a lot of, you know, little similar stuff kind of playing out to what we witnessed basically um, going on up here with our situation, there's, I want to say there's been at least two or three different sites, maybe more than that, that Tampa has looked at for various ballpark locations within the last 15, 20 years. I want to say that one of the sites they looked at uh, back during the time that my boy Carlos Pena was Tampa Bay's first baseman, they actually took Carlos and a couple of the guys out to a ball, to this site uh, and had them take BP. And I want to say, I think Carlos hit a ball into what would have been the water above the, you know, behind the right field wall. Um, as we all know, of course, obviously, that was just one of uh, many futile plans that have um, fallen apart over the years. And um, real quickly here, just I'm going to go over um, the la- the most recent attempt by Tampa Bay to try to get a ballpark uh, secured down there. Um, Tampa Bay Rays, basically, they've been working with Populous, uh, which, of course, is formerly known as HOK, 
on a design for a possible future ball, uh, ballpark since at least the beginning of 2007. The main design point of the proposed stadium was the mast and arc retractable roof. Instead of a solid material sliding roof panel, the roof would have been a fabric covering stored inside the shade of, to the seating. It was to be deployed by a pulley system at the top of the mast to si in six to eight minutes. It would have looked like a sail raising on a boat in the bay or a circus tent being torn away by a stiff wind. The retractable roof design would have been unique in baseball, looking like no ballpark built in this century or less. The concourses of the proposed ballpark were similar to those at Pittsburgh's PNC Park, whereas they would have been enclosed and air-conditioned and fronted with glass on the field side, allowing fans waiting for concessions to view the field. As far as the new stadium, Bayshore Drive, which currently runs along the east side of Al Lang Field, was to be closed during game day activities and become part of the ballpark. The ballpark would have faced the opposite direction of Al Lang Field, with center field on the north. In this configuration, it would have been possible to hit home runs into the water of Tampa Bay beyond the right field wall. I was just talking about that because I think this was a location that had one of the locations they had looked at previously back when my boy Carlos was on the team. Um, anyway, I just want to make sure uh, where I leave off. Um, it would have been possible to hit home runs in the waters of Tampa Bay beyond the right field wall, similar to how home runs can be hit into San Francisco Bay uh, Oracle Park. This configuration would have also placed most of the fans in the shade of the grandstands as the sun sank into the west of, on summer afternoons, migrated heat issues in the open air facility. The open access to Tampa Bay from right field would also have provided a cooling breeze. The original designs for the stadium called for up to 2.55 acres of Tampa Bay to be filled in. By the time the stadium proposal was first made public, the landfill was reduced to 1.05 acres. In May 2008, the team revealed a new design calling for moving Bayshore Drive to a bridge structure, reducing landfill requirement to 0.4 acres. The plan website mentioned that the simple act of moving from a dome to an open-air stadium could reduce the team's carbon footprint by up to 70%. However, the ABC group analyzing stadium needs for the Rays have said that any new stadium must have a fully retractable roof. The design of the ballpark as well as the redevelopment plan for Tropicana Field was released on November 28, 2007. On March 11, 2008, the Rays continued to move forward with plans for a downtown stadium by submitting a preliminary design consideration document to St. Petersburg officials. In addition, the organization announced that a detailed transportation parking study had concluded at, uh, that the Alang site in downtown St. Petersburg is well suited for the Rays' proposed waterfront ballpark. Nearly 14,000 parking spaces that may be available for the majority of ballpark events were identified. A figure does not include roughly 7,000 on-street parking spaces. Some of the downtown's largest intuitions have uh, expressed an entrance to working with the Rays to provide parking for ballpark patrons, including All Children's Hospital, Bayfront Medical Center, and the University of South, uh, Florida, uh, uh, South Florida at St. Petersburg. Uh, just moving forward with things, they obviously, uh, you know, proposal came out, financing came out. And then uh, city and county leaders criticized the referendum plan as being rushed. Um, and just a whole bunch of stuff ended up going down, and the plans for this uh, stadium were ultimately uh, canceled. Um, the Rays also had a proposed uh, plan for a ballpark at Sorellian, um, located in uh, northern uh, St. Petersburg. Um, the stadium, of course, was proposed by Cityscape in 2012 as a replacement for Tropicana Field. And obviously, uh, that site was abandoned in mid-2015 after uh, Cityscape announced that the area would be used for multi-use development area uh, without the Rays Stadium. Um, and that's pretty much how things sit here right now. Um, the last uh, thing that was done at, at anything recently, um, October 14th, it was reported that, uh, that um, who is it here? The, I'm trying to get the names on here. Um, uh, I'll try to get that so basically the Rays owner was frustrated with efforts to build a new stadium in the Tampa Bay area had discussions with Wall Street Associates about moving the Rays to Montreal which it have been without an MLB franchise since the Expos moved to D.C. in 2005 to become the Nationals. In January 2016, the city of St. Petersburg allowed the team to explore options for their new ballpark. Uh, July 10th of 2018, the Rays announced they would vacate Tropicana Field and re relocate to the proposed Yarber Stadium, which is the rendering that you see on there in Tampa before the start of the 2023 season. Uh, however, that December in 2018, the project was canceled, and that's pretty much where... Things sit at this point in time as pretty much the Rays' future in uh, the Tampa Bay area is uh, pretty much in limbo, I guess you can say, at this point. And you no, know, you heard Boss touch basis on it earlier. Um, no city, no fan base should have to go through losing a franchise, regardless of sport. I mean, 
you all know how we feel out here as, as football fans. We've seen our football team ripped from us twice, unfortunately, because of uh, stupidity and uh, mistakes made by the person in charge at that time or not willing to want to work with people and, you know, stuff we've touched bases on. Uh, same thing goes with, you know, in baseball, you know, or just sports in general. You know, we saw it for years what, you know, the talk about the possible ability of the A's relocating to Fremont and then San Jose, how much that impacted and hurt this fan base. And the reality is the fan base is still reeling from that, along with all the other crap that has set this team back since the Haas era. Um, hopefully they're heading in the right direction with plans for this Howard Terminal ballpark. Um, we obviously still wait to see, and we'll continue to inform you on what's going on with that. So I can fully understand and relate to probably – what fans down there in Tampa Bay are going through. There's a lot of questions and concerns probably about the future of your team's franchise. And, hey, maybe beating the Dodgers in this year's World Series and bringing a title finally down there to, uh, to Tampa Bay will finally kickstart some talks into getting back in to doing that. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm amongst many out there who firmly believes Montreal does deserve to have a baseball team at some point. Obviously, it was uh, brought up by one of our friends that uh, co-runs the Coco Crisp uh, uh, Afro page that, you know, Montreal kind of had some shit attendance there near the end of their time there. Yeah, it was fully understandable, but what else do you expect after they got screwed out of the potential possibility of being, you know, the team that probably would have won the 94 World Series if there hadn't been a strike. That strike and a lot of crap that happened after that is basically what doomed the future of baseball up there. Not to mention you ended up with a garbage-ass owner who wanted to get out of there and couldn't get out of there, ended up selling the team to MLB, and MLB ultimately decided, hey, we need to move these guys. And probably a decision that some up there, even though they may not want to admit, admit to it, it's a decision I'm pretty sure that some in baseball are regretting that was done. So, yes, I fully agree that – an Expos 2.0 should happen. It should not be at the expense of the Tampa Bay Rays, though. That is completely unfair to fans in Tampa. That's completely unfair to the franchise and the players up there. You know, don't go and do that. Don't go and please one fan base by screwing over another. That's not cool. The reality of it is the folks that are the powers that be down there in Tampa Bay that run the Rays, need to get back to the table with St. Petersburg or the city of Tampa Bay or just something going on in there. Honestly, you know, from talking to people that we here at the show know that either have friends down there that are Rays fans or some of the few Rays fans that I've crossed paths with over the years, many of them have always felt that if the team were to finally get a downtown ballpark, many of them, of course, have been in favor of the team being moved across the bridge into Tampa quite honestly, if that team were finally able to get that downtown ballpark, you'd actually start to see fans show up. It's kind of a similar situation to what many say here about the Coliseum now. Yes, we all know 50, 60 years ago, the Coliseum complex was the pinnacle of sports entertainment, you know, and sports complexes. It was the state of the art sports complex. 50, 60 years later, not so much the case. And especially when it you know, when it comes to baseball, let's be real. MLB baseball should be in a downtown setting. The only reason why the Coliseum ended up out here was because, one, the land was cheaper than building it over there where Laney College is now. Two, that was kind of unfortunately the result of the whole cookie-cutter, you know, multi-purpose stadiums of the 60s and 70s. They kind of, you know, went away from that downtown setting to a suburban setup. And, you know, it's one of the big things that a lot of A's fans, including myself, have touched bases on, which is the problem with the Coliseum site in this day and age, which is there ain't squat to do around it before a game and after a game if you're a casual fan. Because let's face it, not everybody's like me, boss man, and the guys that make up the left field and right field bleacher crew and some of the others out there. Not everybody likes to tailgate, man. Everybody has their own different tastes. People like to go to bars, go to restaurants, you know, go and do stuff before and after a game. You can't do that here. It's one of the reasons why the A's are pushing to go to Howard Terminal. And a lot of that happens to be the same case, apparently, down there where Tropicana Field is located at in St. Petersburg. Uh, I saw it was it a comment from a friend of Mike Davies um, when I commented on a post that Mike put out earlier today um, in regards to um, stuff with Tampa Bay. And uh, it was part of this whole, I guess, part of the argument out there that some are saying that 
people should be rooting for the Dodgers in this World Series instead of the Rays because they feel if the Rays win, it's going to give the rest of baseball an excuse to become a bunch of cheap asses. Yeah, maybe, maybe not, but let's be real. I'll tell you three teams that won't be cheap asses if that were to happen. The Yankees, the Red Sox, and the Dodgers, I'm pretty sure, will not turn in to a team with raised size payroll. Nah, that, that ain't going to happen. The other teams, maybe, I don't know, but, you know, pfft. Um, But anyway, back to the focus of this segment right now. Just like with a lot of the issues and complaints you hear about uh, that fans have with the area around the Coliseum now and why the push for a a waterfront slash downtown ballpark at Howard Terminal is the focal point here, same thing there with fans in Tampa Bay. I want to say this friend of Mike said that there's like, I think, one barbecue spot there. And, you know, I've heard about this place before, too. It's apparently a dope barbecue spot, but... You know, regardless of how dope it is, I'm sorry, one spot is not going to cut it. It just isn't. You need to have access to stuff like, you know, what we see down in L.A., what we've seen develop across the Bay ever since the Giants set up shop there at 3rd and King. We've all seen what, what they and the city have done in that little neighborhood right there. And you've seen similar setups, you know, Across baseball, you know, the, the close proximity of the gas lamp district, for example, where, where Petco Park is. And, you know, it, it's a common thread you've seen with a lot of these ballparks that have opened up in downtown settings over the course of the last 20, 30 years, beginning with the whole trend being started by Oriole Park at Canham Yards back in Baltimore. Um, again, you got to make sure that you earn a great it's location, location, location is pretty much the point I'm trying to hammer here. And just like with us, and I'm pretty sure this is the case with every team in every major sport, let's be real. Your hardcore fans are not the people you're going to be making money off of. Oakland Athletics aren't making their money off of me. I'm a penny drop in the bucket for them. They know that I'm a guaranteed ass in the seat every year and out. Same thing with my main man, the boss man. Same thing with a lot of the guys we know out there in the left field, right field bleachers. You have that same case and those same type of fans all across baseball, all across professional sports. We aren't the ones moving the needles when it comes to making money. It's the casual fans that are doing that across sports. And obviously that seems to be the case here in Tampa Bay, that regardless if you got one good-ass barbecue joint there, given where Tropicana Field is, that's why nobody wants to mess with it and wants to go to it because it's basically out in the boondocks there in St. Petersburg. So... Definitely feel that the Tampa Bay Rays need to get back on top of things and get back to working with uh, St. Petersburg or one of those cities down there in the Tampa region, and they need to lock in their future down there. And uh, maybe raising the commissioner's trophy is what can kickstart those talks into developing uh, again down there. You know, because like I said, I, I would hate to ultimately see that team have to uproot and move to Montreal because nothing can get down down get done down there. Again, I like anybody else would love to see the Montreal Expos come back, but it should not be at the expense of Tampa Bay Rays fans. Um, so hey, if you're Tampa Bay Rays fan and you're tuning in, if I'm you, I'm hoping your team wins the World Series and pray to hope that that can possibly kickstart talks to get this uh, Yarber Field st- talk started back up or just get something started and talked back up. Period. Um, in regards to um, (laughs) some sort of ballpark getting built down there. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, final break of the night coming at you here on A's Fan Radio. We come back. I will, of course, read your responses to the fan question of the night, which, of course, you can uh, chime in right now and get your last uh, input in before I get to it if you haven't done so yet. Facebook.com slash A's Fan Radio or at A's underscore fan underscore radio to submit your response to the fan question of the night, which, of course, we want to hear from y'all on your thoughts on how things played out in both the AL and NLCSs. And we also want to hear from you. Who do you think is going to win the World Series and in how many games? Your responses to the fan questions of the night and, of course, my final thought of the night coming at you when we wrap up with the final commercial break heading into the final segment of tonight's edition of A's Fan Radio. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back at you here on show number 278, the Playoff Editions.
And welcome back as we get set to close up shop here. The final segment on this playoff edition of your number one source for everything and anything on your Oakland Athletics. Show number 278, the playoff editions of A's Fan Radio, getting ready to wrap things up here with our final segment of the night. And as always, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, of course, for checking us out, as always, and supporting A's Talk from the fans' point of view. We have always loved to give you our input and our take. Sorry, by the way, as my hat uh, collides with the mic there. Hey, we know a lot of you obviously tune in and like to listen to uh, stuff that's done out there from like our fr- our good friends out there, Chris Townsend, you know, reading stuff from likes of Suzanne Slusser and others out there. But we also love and appreciate the fact that y'all like to check out and hear alternative takes on your green and gold and what's going on in the baseball and sports world in general. And hey, we might be underground, but we come hitting hard at you like a mainstream broadcast. And it's one thing I always loved and appreciate to hear from y'all out there is how y'all know and understand that, hey, we're one of y'all. We're just like y'all out there. We just happen to utilize our means and our fandom a little bit differently than y'all and are able to week in and week out bring you a professional FM quality podcast. Uh it can be a little bit foul mouth at times, depending on <laughs> what the mood and what the you know the talk is that's going on here at the show. Um, looks like, unfortunately, yet again, none of you knuckleheads responded to the fan question of the night on Facebook. Uh, you know, and I, I, I put out a warning an hour before the show that the question was going to come out there. So you know, come on, guys. Again, more often than not, there is always going to be a fan question of the night. I'll try it obviously on certain shows if we end up not having one or if I can't come up with one, giving y'all an advance heads up notice. But I'll just put it this way: unless you hear from me otherwise, expect the fan question of the night every freaking show, and keep your eyes open because usually that fan question uh, will get posted roughly about five minutes after we go live, and about you know, or about roughly five minutes after you see the uh, tweet or post notification that we're online. So again, y'all, come on. It's A's Fan Radio. It's not supposed to be about just myself and boss running our mouths, you know, even though, yeah, that is what mostly happens. But this is your opportunity to get your opinion heard outside of us just staring at your responses on social media. So, yeah, again, nobody responding to the fan question of the night over on Facebook. We do at least have one response on Twitter. So, hey, I'm I'm not left fully high and dry here on this show. Um, That lone response coming from the Fat Boy Fadeaway Sports Podcast uh, which, of course, is um, trying to remember where they're located on. They're located out of Cloverdale, California, so be sure to check them out. Uh, you can follow them on Twitter, at FatboyFadeaway. Uh, here is their response to the uh, to the fan question of the night. Uh, was great to have both series go seven. Hard watching because it reminds me how far the A's are. Seems like third time should be the charm for L.A. Rays are a good matchup for them. Don't win this. You're starting to become the Buffalo Bills. Um, and Fat Boy Fadeaway po- uh, Sports Podcast has the Dodgers in five. So uh, that being our lone response to the uh, the fan question of the night. Uh, and of course, though, let me um, get an opportunity to refresh things. I'll refresh things on Twitter here as well, just in case if uh, one of you knuckleheads somehow there without me paying attention uh, snuck in a fan question of the night without me uh, being a chance to look at it. Uh, let me look here real quick. Um, not loading up on Facebook or yeah, Twitter loaded. Yeah, just the only only response being from Fat Boy Fadeaway Sports Podcast. And uh, let me take a look again on Facebook and see maybe if one of y'all squeezed in a response to the fan question of the night. Waiting, waiting, still waiting. God, this is what I hate about the internet. Why can't you load faster? Uh, yeah, none of y'all responded to the fan question of the night on Facebook. So y'all suck, man. Y- y'all, I'm, I'm messing with you. I'm joking about the suck part. But again, as mentioned, ladies and gentlemen, keep your eyes open every night or not every night, every broadcast for a fan question of the night, unless I say something at the beginning of the show or I post something um, that says otherwise um, in regards to that. So, yep, that's it right there. That wraps up the uh, the fan question of the night segment. And, yeah, sucks there was only one response, but, hey, I guess that's what happens sometimes. As always, ladies and gentlemen, for the latest information pertaining to your number one source for everything and anything on your Oakland Athletics, be sure to check us out at A'sFanRadio.com. Like us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash A'sFanRadio. Follow us on Twitter at A's underscore fan underscore radio. And, of course, uh, for those of you that don't know, we have our own YouTube channel now. Be sure to go to the uh, search window on YouTube and type in A's Fan Radio as one whole word, and then you, of course, at that point, will see our YouTube channel pop up. And again, our next broadcast will come at you 
on October the 29th as we finally go back to uh, doing this madness of a show on Thursdays like we uh, normally try to do. That, of course, being uh, show number 279, the playoff editions, the final playoff edition show of 2020 is, of course, we will be recapping uh, what ends up going down in the fall classic between the Rays and the Dodgers on that show. So again, show number 279, the playoff editions coming at you on Thursday, October the 29th at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And of course, you can catch that live broadcast right here where you're watching the show right now on twitch.tv slash A's Fan Radio. You, of course, can also watch the uh, the recording of that broadcast on our Twitch channel, as well as also the uh, YouTube version of the show, which will be added, of course, um, at some point following that show or the next day. And uh, going to try to get the YouTube version of tonight's show uploaded by tonight if I can. But, you know, I'm really trying to not be up until 3, 4 o'clock in the morning working on stuff. And, uh, yeah, for those of you that don't know, that I easily put in 10 to 12 hours each show with this, you know, with pre-show prep, uh, the show itself, and then all the post-show prep with taking down the gear, um, editing the finalized copy of the show, making the YouTube version of the show. Yeah, I easily put in 10-plus hours on this podcast. So for those of you looking out, out there that are looking into getting into this business, for those of you that think it's just as simple as me setting up this computer, setting up these mics and all that, it takes a lot more than that. And, you know, some out there might be shocked that I got the patience and the energy to do with it. But, hey, I've been doing this for 17 years, man been basically approaching a decade of running this bad boy now um, since 2011. So, yeah, there's times it drives me up the wall. It does get annoying, but, hey, got 17 years and counting to hone my craft and used to it. So, again, there's all the various places you can check us out online, and, of course, be sure to catch our next show broadcast on October the 29th at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right here on twitch.tv slash A's Fan Radio. That, of course, uh, brings me to my final thought of the evening. And um, my final thought of the evening uh, is in regards to some, uh, let me pull it up here real quick, is in regards to some uh, little tidbit of information that uh, came across the uh, Twitter news feed earlier in the day uh, in regards to some stuff that uh, Suzanne Slusser uh, happened to put out, uh, mentioning that obviously there's a lot of uh, internal movements going on with the Oakland Athletics uh, one thing that some of you may not be aware of is that A's executive uh, Billy Owens is currently under uh, consideration for the uh, general manager's job down there with the Anaheim Angels. Um, the A's are expecting to retain nearly all of their scouts um, from the scouting department, but uh, obviously with the possibility, well, not with the possibility, looking at the fact that Major League Baseball is looking to cut some minor league teams, uh, kind of understandable that this move ended up going down. Um, one of those guys, of course, unfortunately, that uh, will know that was let go by the A's was longtime scout and minor league coach uh, and manager Rick McNante, who, of course, had been with the A's for 25 years and had also managed in the World Baseball Classic. Um, among those that McNante, of course, signed to A's contracts were uh, Barry Zito, Bobby Crosby, and uh, Eric Burns, just to name a few. And uh, other tidbit as well, I'm just trying to... Um, dig up where it was exactly um based on uh, what susan put out here i'm just trying to find it um out of the 160 employees um that are there the a's are looking at basically retaining about 92 percent of their baseball operations staff uh roughly about a dozen out of the 160 employees there will not be back uh, unfortunately it's kind of something that we're seeing happening around the sport in general. The uh, the Giants just let go of about 50, 55 uh, permanent employees because of, you know, stuff that they've suffered as far as, you know, cuts and lost revenue from the uh, coronavirus pandemic. And ultimately, um, you're going to see... Um, Ah, as I'm getting tongue twisted here, you're probably going to see that ripple effect across all of baseball with all of, of Major League Baseball's uh, teams having to make some sort of cuts. And uh, I just hope, honestly, that, you know, none of the people I know that work in that front office, especially the people that I know the, that have been with that team going back to the Haas era, end up losing their job because that would be extremely screwed up. And, you know, I'll be, I'm not going to be frank about it that'd be extremely fucked up if a lot of those people that have been with the team for that long or let go you know i understand it i get it you have to do something but you know again you know you have to also look at the possibility that depending on who's let go and from where 
could this be something that triggers um, an upheaval in the front office and causes people to want to start voicing their frustration um, in time with what a lot of us have said, which is that it's time for a certain individual that owns this team that is the fourth richest owner in baseball to shit or get off the pot, a.k.a. spend some fucking money or sell this fucking team already to somebody that is going to invest in that. Uh, I've, I've stated multiple times. You, you all have always asked me out there my two cents on if I think Fisher is going to sell the team at some point. I ultimately think he does. I just don't see it happening until after things with the new ballpark happens. Now, obviously, something could happen before that that could drastically change that, and one of the things that I could see ultimately doing that would be some situation within the front office where just something goes down that's finally the tipping point and basically turns everybody against John. Um, I know many in that front office who for years loathed what Lou Wolf was doing, how Lou Wolf was running things, and just all these various different aspects. You know, many of us out there, you, you probably thought that well, the fans were the only ones that hated Lou. There were people in that front office that hated the guy too and were beyond happy as hell when he finally stepped aside and sold off all but one percent of the team but basically sold off enough to the point where he doesn't have say in shit anymore kind of starting to wonder right now myself and some of you out there probably are wondering it as well um could something similar beginning to brew in that front office in regards to john fisher o- only only time will tell you know and it just it, it sucks and unfortunate you know nobody should have to lose their job you know especially because of you know a pandemic but l- l- let's be real this is a guy in John Fisher who is not hurting for cash. Yeah, we all know that he, sales with his damn gap empire have been down, but come on, people. This dude is swimming in money like Mr. Fucking Krabs. He ain't hurting for, for cash at this point. That dude has money, 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 money for fucking days on end, pure and simple. So, you know, maybe this is just, you know, feeding in is me talking just because of how I feel about the guy. All that money you got, dude, there should be no reason why anybody should be getting cut. You should be obviously, you know, looking into alternatives, other various ways of generating and making money to retain these people. But I guarantee you that, you know, if, you know, obviously not payroll expanded, but maybe if certain things were done, you may be able to retain everybody. You're only let half of those dozen people go. But it's going to be real interesting to see ultimately who else is let go from this team and their various positions? And like I said, ultimately, how is it gonna? How much of an effect is it gonna have on things going forward? You know, like I said, man, it, it's going to be a really, really interesting off season here in Oakland, just with a lot of stuff going on. This whole situation that I just talked about, um, whatever the future is for Billy Bean, um, sitting back and waiting to see how things develop as far as stuff with the Howard Terminal Ballpark. Uh, project goes on forward and it's going to also be interesting to see not just how the pandemic has impacted things here with the A's but how much ultimately the impact uh, in general of this pandemic has had as far as an effect on the other 29 teams in baseball too and pretty much you know across the whole spectrum of sports it's going to be real interesting to see how everybody in baseball makes it through there so again sucks to see that the A's are letting people go I feel, obviously, that things could be done to prevent maybe not everybody, but the majority of those people from being let go. And, hey, you're John Fisher. You better pray and hope that this doesn't start a revolt in your front office. On behalf of the cast of A's Fan Radio, and, of course, on behalf of my co-host, the main man, the boss man, who was with us at the beginning of the show, I am the legally 5150 corporal right field asshole. Y'all take care. And enjoy the rest of your Monday night. (laughs) 
The views and opinions of our cast, our guests, and our listeners are in no way, shape, or form affiliated with the Oakland Athletics or Major League Baseball. Good night, Walter Haas. Good night, King Al, forever screw your bowl cut, coked out son. And good night, Chesty Puller, wherever you may be. And hey, of course, good night to you, Auntie Dide. Sorry that the A's couldn't win for you this year, but hey, maybe you can work out something with the baseball gods so we can take it all in 2021. Take care, everybody. Thank you all again for joining us for another exciting rendition of Monday Night AFR. Screw Monday Night Raw. Screw Monday Night Football. When we're on Monday night, that's who you should be tuned into. Y'all take care. Be safe. Don't drink and drive. Wrap it before you tap it. All that same old ridiculous, nonsense, political, crazy-ass bullshit that I heard on every single safety brief when I was in the Marine Corps. Because, hey, we want to see you back here for another show when we, of course, return to our normal bat time on Thursday nights when we come at you for show number 279 next Wednesday night. And, hey, it's going to be real interesting to uh, look back and recap on uh, what goes down with this 2020 World Series where, again, of course, I got the Rays winning it in six – or, excuse me, I got the Rays winning it in the full seven games. Boss has them winning it in six games. And, hey, it's going to be real interesting, man, and looking forward to talking about that and anything else that goes down as far as A's and baseball news between now and then. Until then, take care. Be safe, everybody, and like always from this show, good night, Oakland and beyond, and as always, be sure to stay Oakland, my friends. Take care, everybody. See you next Thursday night. Let's celebrate.